Thank you very much, uh, Francis. It's another great pleasure to be here again on this stage to discuss matters to do with uh, healthcare financing. Before we start, I just want to thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon for our healthcare financing session. My name is David Kawaya, as you can tell, I'm the current country director for health policy plus Kenya. I took over from my predecessor, Stephen Mushiri, whom I'll be introducing shortly uh, during the panel discussion. We have about one hour or so to discuss uh, matters to do with healthcare financing we are with a very rich panel of uh, colleagues who have been there when these things have happened. And uh, our focus today is not about what we achieved, but how we achieved whatever we achieved, which is very important because we hope that type of uh, sharing of experience will be able to assist uh, those of us who may be there tomorrow to continue with this good work that we have been doing. And uh, so we will have a discussion on how we approach the healthcare financing challenges across the three important countries. Uh, we are represented here by Kenya. We are also represented by Cambodia, as well as uh, Nigeria. These are some of the good countries that we have uh, to showcase the type of work that we have done across the years that we have been in existence. So to introduce my panelists, uh, I have uh, Francis Ilika. As you know, she has been here basically the whole day. So <laughs> I'll not, I'll, I'll not uh, introduce her very much because I think she has been here and she has been introduced before. But Francis Ilika is our country director of Health Policy Plus Nigeria. She's a medical doctor and health systems expert who has supported UHC reforms in low and middle income countries. So we have quite a lot of experience that we will learn from uh, Francis. Then on uh, the immediate next to her is uh, Robert Kosa. Robert Kosa is a former uh, HP Plus uh, Senior Health Finance Advisor to the National Social Protection Council under the Ministry of Economy and Finance in Cambodia. Robert Kosa worked with Nariti in Cambodia and uh, he's here. Uh, he will be sharing experience that they have worked together with Nariti in, in, in Cambodia, and we will be very excited to learn about the experience that uh, we will hear from uh, Robert. Then on my immediate left is uh, Mr. Mushiri, he's a senior advisor with the Palladium and the former country director for Health Policy Plus Kenya. Mr. Mushiri also worked with the Ministry of Health in Kenya for many, many years before he joined the Palladium. So we actually have two sets of experience, the experience from the government and experience from working with Palladium. So that's a very great experience also to, to, to learn. But before we get to, to that, the discussion today, uh, I also have questions for our audience. And uh, we will try to be very brief with our questions so that uh, we move very fast. So on our table, there is a QR code. That QR code, please scan it and uh, answer some very simple questions. So if you get the question right, you remain in the hall. If you get it wrong, we send you away. <laughs> but there are very simple questions. Uh, please scan the code and uh, respond to the questions. So uh, to start us off, I want to invite Eduardo. Eduardo uh, Gonzalez Pia is a senior technical director for health finance at Health Policy Plus. He has worked extensively uh, in designing and implementing health financing reforms in Mexico and other countries. And I know, uh, Eduardo, you've been in cabinet before, so we, we, we appreciate uh, your transition to join us in the development work. So please come and share what Health Policy Plus has been doing, and then also share your experience. Thank you, David. Thanks to everybody. I've been tasked with a very difficult uh, case of presenting an overview of health financing in HP Plus in 10 minutes. And I think that's <laughs> challenging. And that is uh, probably unfair because of the richness of the work that has been done. Let me start with a specific note on a personal side. Before joining HP Plus, I was uh, working with the Mexican government for 20 years. And uh, I joined the Ministry of Health in the year 2000. Uh, back then, we had a health minister which was very uh, engaged and committed to health reform. He had a very uh, substantial health reform. He invited me as the health economist. 
for the Ministry of Health. And uh, we started planning and devising and simulating and it was a very strong legal team that was writing the reform. We pretty much did most of the uh, sign work, the lobbying, talked to the 32 governors, uh, talked to uh, Congress members, but we didn't have the funding. So uh, he pretty much tasked me and says, well, why don't you talk to the Ministry of Finance? I later found out that he had hired me in part because I had been, I had gone through the same PhD program that uh, the Minister of Finance and the Undersecretary of the Budget had gone through. And I was charged of uh, trying to convince them we needed another 1% of GDP to have the reform implemented. I would say that the design was difficult. Uh, talking to governors was very tough. Congress members, uh, they all wanted this stuff. But the most challenging, and quoting uh, Modibo, the most difficult part was mobilizing resources. We, we did manage to get 1% of GDP for a seven year transition. That allowed us to, uh, at the time, launch what was known as Seguro Popular. Seguro Popular affiliated 60 million people, half of the Mexican population. I think it was a, a fairly success story. I would say that it was very challenging when you talk to the Ministry of Finance and you tell them, well, we need more funds. Well, why do you need funds if you can't really spend the budget that you have? Why do you need funds if your hospitals are empty because they're not used? Why do you need funds? Your procurement process is a mess. So, so having all that evidence to insert it at the right time to make sure that you have the arguments for mobilizing resources is so important. And I think that's what I managed to appreciate as, as part of HP Plus. I would just say that I wish that HP Plus was around in the year 2000, and we would have gotten 2% uh, of GDP, not 1% of GDP. But in any case, let me start with this task of uh, giving you a sense of the richness of the breadth uh, of the health financing. Uh, first thing we can do is try to see how many countries we're participating in. We, we counted 46 countries we worked on. That's as, uh, pretty much as much as HP Plus has worked. So almost all the countries HP Plus has had a presence has also had some health financing component. And I think that's very impressive. We worked around the six themes, uh, most importantly around uh, family planning, 20, 21 countries of uh, family planning experience in health financing, HIV, 21 countries, uh, maternal and child care, 17 countries, uh, we also managed to work across cost-cutting issues in health reform, mobilizing resources more generally. That was uh, 16 countries. And more recently, the possibility of repurposing health financing to help with the COVID response was very important. That was seven countries. So I think it's a very, very rich experience. Of course, the length, the depth, the amount of uh, capacities that were mobilized. And as we work in different areas, it becomes even more challenging, but also there's synergies around working in different uh, areas. Now, if we want to uh, understand what was done or how it was framed, sometimes it's difficult to understand what health financing is about. And there's many ways to explain it. But I think one possible way, one of the many, is to understand the challenges. If you think about what are the main health financing challenges, I would mention three. There's not enough resources for health, especially when we uh, united to the uh, universal health coverage agenda. It's just that uh, uh, low-income countries are spending 6% of GDP. That's not enough. One-fourth of that is uh, government spending. That's definitely not enough. The other one-fourth is external spending, external uh, funding. And then half of it is out of pocket payments. So without compensation and that level of spending, it's not going to be enough resource mobilization. And you probably, some of you have been answering that's the most uh, pressing challenge. That's a good guess. Second, it's about how to use, how to, how to put those resources together. It's a pooling question. It's about the integration. Uh, Melissa Jones this morning reminded us about the importance of equity. Equity into the system. Equity is done through the pooling mechanism. It's about uh, the healthy subsidizing the poor. It's about the rich subsidizing the sick. It's about uh, putting everybody in the same pool risk, creating solidarity. So that is another way to frame it. That's uh, part of the agenda that we've done in HP Plus. And purchasing. Purchasing is about delivering value for money. It's about translating the pool resources into efficient services, into commodities. Uh, there's way to go about it. And uh, I would say that one of the big challenges 
in all countries is the amount of waste you have in the system, and waste can be tackled if you have good purchasing strategies. So those three are the main challenges. Let me go a little bit more in depth into each one of them. So resource mobilization. Resource mobilization is about more resources for health from the public sector, but it's also about the quality of that financing. It's not only more resources, they have to be sustainable, they have to be predictable. One way to do it is, of course, to find uh, government sources to fund that. But remember that most of the financing, at least half, is through private sources. So it's also about working with the private sector so that the private resources that are mobilized complement rather than substitute. They work hand in hand. In order to mobilize resources, there's many strategies. The obvious one is making the case for investment in health, making authorities, especially the Ministry of Finance, understand that investing in health is a good decision. It creates welfare societies, it creates more tax revenues. So health makes sense as an investment. Second is, if you have a fixed revenue, let's make sure that that grows. So um, taxes, sin taxes for health is a good way to mobilize resources. It's also about um, a bigger share of the existing budget. And why making the case that health is a better or just as a good investment as other very uh, good investments like education, poverty alleviation, building roads, building uh, infrastructure. And it's also about uh, finding a reliable source of funding for family planning, for HIV, and for all the programs that we're most concerned about. It is also about how to mix multilateral sources of funding with public sources, how they work together rather than substitute each other. And it's about private financing again. Make sure that works. It's going to be around for a long time. Let's make sure that that happens in a very efficient way. Quickly go over the pooling of funds. Very rich experience in HP Plus about pooling funds. I would say that uh, there's two sources, the systematic way, meaning if we work around health reform process, it's about how to bring more and more populations into a single source of funding. It's about diversifying the risk for the population, and that would be uh, uh, enrollment efforts with that. And, uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll hear more about the specific uh, experiences of Nigeria, Cambodia, and Kenya. But it's also about integrating vertical programs into mainstream programs basically on universal health coverage that are much more resourced and better organized. Uh, we've done that in 11 countries and uh, the resource has been, I think, uh, very impressive in the sense that uh, we have provided the right evidence, helped the countries to provide a right uh, way to approach this with the, uh, with the governments and with the ministries of health and finance. And then strategic purchasing. Strategic purchasing is, is very broad, it's very complex. We've done this in at least uh, 26 countries. We've helped advise governments, agencies, to see how they can make the budget work better. Public finance mechanisms are very important. It's a way to advocate for better resources. We've done it also in terms of uh, making procurement processes work better, how to purchase commodities, how to purchase services from civil society, it's also about uh, making the private sector work better, making market service uh, in a more efficient way, the health system. And it's also about understanding what uh, things cost. A good way to see whether there's efficiencies is understanding what is the cost of uh, what we do, how we can explain that, how we can uh, provide the evidence, and that evidence gets used to be uh, uh, fed into policy making and used to our uh, several other purposes, but uh, the, the work on this is uh, continuous, it's changing, but it's also being adapted as we heard this morning, it is contextualized to country needs so that this is more and more effective if it recognizes very country specific uh, things. We uh, have three slides where we'll be presented as the speakers are discussing, it's about results. Uh, every time we talk to Sunita, she reminds us, it's results, 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 so there's three slides on the results of Kenya, the results of uh, Cambodia, and the results of Nigeria. They'll be playing, so you can see them as, uh, as the speakers present the uh, country-specific situations. But I would like to stress the importance, the, the very amazing numbers that uh, HP Plus has managed to help with. 
help achieve through the uh, engagement with, uh, with governments. I would finalize by just mentioning that all this has been about teamwork. It's been about the DC-based health financing team working with our, our local counterparts, people at the country office that has been an exemplary uh, relationship. It's about working with local technical agencies, working with the universities in the countries, working with the NGOs. It's also working about, uh, across the partners. Some of them are here that we have as part of the HP Plus Consulting and Health Financing work. And of course, it's been working with uh, missions, understanding countries, understanding stakeholders, understanding what's happening in the field and how we can be most helpful by uh, being best informed and understanding how to do those precision advocacy evidence work that helps make the difference. Thank you very much, and I'll pass back to uh, Thank you, Eduardo, I think, uh, for presenting those uh, exciting results. But as I promised to you at the beginning, we want to focus on how we achieve the results. We will not focus on what the results are, but how we achieve them, which is very important for us and also lessons to be shared to colleagues and other projects or future projects to emulate. And so before we get the panelists to assist me uh, discuss these issues around healthcare financing, I had given you uh, some questions. So the question was, what do you think is the main obstacle uh, keeping low and middle income countries from reaching universal health coverage by 2030? And majority of you have said funding is insufficient and predictable and not sustainable. So we would like uh, to actually uh, uh, take up from the, uh, this, and I really thank you very much for participating with this in the Dimitra, so that you give us these good results. Uh, we also thought that that was a problem. Even if I didn't vote, if I had voted, that bar would have been said So, so let, me, let me get uh, closer to my panelists so that we can discuss some of these issues so that you understand how. And because I've already introduced my panelists, uh, I'll go straight to asking them first what they think about the results, because the audience have said that funding is the biggest challenge. Uh, so I'll first get your uh, uh, reaction on that, and then uh, as you respond to the questions I ask, then we can move on. For example, Mr. Mshiri, I would like to find out, because from Kenya, we know that Kenya as a country has um, <coughs> successfully managed it the transition away from donor funding. And so we would like to hear your, the experience of how HP Plus supported this type of transition, going to uh, domestic financing, uh, moving away from domestic, I mean, from donor uh, fund funding. Please share the experience of Kate. Uh, thank you, David. I think let me start by saying that the transition has been, uh, is a journey. It's a long journey. Uh, I must admit that uh, when I was in government, I was still discussing about transitioning. I joined up transitioning, now Caribbean transition is the wrong journey. And sometimes this journey can be very bumpy, very bumpy. <laughs> uh, in Kenya, uh, to manage this bumpy journey, they use three, pro three pronged approach. The first approach is creating a conducive environment, which is important if you're going to discuss about health financing, you create that conducive environment. And for that conducive environment, they developed what they are calling the Kenya Health Policy Framework. And HPP, HP Plus HP was instrumental in supporting the development of that key health policy. And in the policy, the health financing uh, section, there were two strategic objectives. First is increasing domestic resources, getting more money from the government. And I think that's why I agree with Mr. Minister that that's very important. The second is efficiency use of those resources. So that policy sets the tone for transitioning and we got a political buy from the government that now they have approved the policy. The second from the approach is developing what they were calling the Kenya Healthcare Financing Strategy. The strategy was looking at how do we mobilize funding to be able to get more domestic resources so that you are able to win yourself from external, external funding. This strategy uh, the HP Plus supported the evidence that was used for the strategy. The HP Plus supported the engagement framework. And in engagement, we had both county and national government, critical because we were involved, uh, we were involved government. 
And more important is the national treasury to get a buy-in in terms of them agreeing <coughs> that we concur that the financing framework that we are putting on board, we can be able to finance. So that was very, very important. And finally is the legal framework. Under the legal framework, we had two major uh, laws that we developed. The first is what we call the health, the health bill that anchored the whole force in the policy and the strategy into law. And once you get the money, it's important for you to really have a legal framework that will ensure that that money flows to the system. So for that to happen, Treasury and uh, the financial management developed what they were calling the Public Financial Management Act of 2012. Very critical to ensure that you have got the money, you are using it properly, but the money is flowing through the system to be able to reach the facility. So very, very important. And HP Plus was instrumental in supporting the entire process from policy, the strategy, and the laws that, that, that were developed. Some outcomes that what we saw is that um, uh, the government, because of the advocacy with the Treasury, was able to increase its budget allocation from 5.5% in 2005 to 11.1% this year. Almost double, double the funding. And secondly, in 2005, we had zero funding for ARVs, ARVs. Today, we have mobilized through the same budget processes about $40 million for ARVs. Good progress. And if I probably pick on, I'm picking on a few of them, I'll pick on FP, FP commodities, we had zero funding at 005. Today, we have got $10 million that the government has located for FP commodities. So you can see, because we had, we had good policy, we had good strategy, and we have got the laws, we are able to do the advocacy, and that advocacy has yielded substantial funding to support both HIV and, 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 and family planning. I talk about TB, I talk about Pajamalegio, but I wanted to give an example of those two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mushiri, for sharing the experience from Kenya, especially on how uh, resource mobilization was done and the strategies that you applied. But before I get to you, Robert, uh, let me allow me to ask uh, uh, Francis because the question is more or less uh, related. Francis, Nigeria embarked in an ambitious health reform process in 2014, but faced some challenges, and especially around decentralization and so on. Maybe you could share the experiences from Nigeria for our audience who may also want to hear how you navigated through those type of challenges. Thank you very much, David. So I'm actually happy to be here to share this experience. So Nigeria, just to give a little bit of a background, Nigeria is facing the health financing issues that many low and middle income countries are facing. So for instance, over 70% of health expenditure is out of pocket which we know is not ideal. It's much more than the less than 30% that is recommended based on UHC platforms. Another example is that the government per capita spending is um, $12 per capita. That's against the $86 recommended. So that tells you about the huge gap in financing that is in the country. Of course, the government is not just you know not doing anything about it. Some excellent policy have been put in place, including laws over the years to address this problem and translate to better financing of the health system by the government. One of these um, excellent policies is the decentralization of health insurance. So Nigeria, at the same time as Ghana, started setting up a, a national health scheme that will make sure that everybody has health insurance coverage in the country and has access to quality health care. However, Nigeria has a very complex system we run a federal system. So according to the Constitution, the states have the right to set their own health um, interventions and they, they can adopt or adapt what is done at the national level or they could decide not to do anything about it. So it was as a result of that that this national health insurance scheme was not gaining a lot of traction over a decade, right? So in 2015, the National Council on Health decided to decentralize health insurance and give states the right to set up their own health insurance agencies in order to gain traction in this regard. So the other one was that the National Health Act of 2014 actually sets in place what is called the Basic Health Care Provision Fund that stems from 1% of the consolidated revenue of the Federation, um, approximately about 55 billion naira a year, 
to go as a form of intergovernmental fiscal transfer from the federal level down to the state level. And it's supposed to go to the state level and provide health insurance coverage, as well as strengthen primary health care, make sure that there is basic drugs, equipment, human resources at the primary health care level to provide a basic package of care, especially to poor and vulnerable populations. Now, these excellent policies were there, but nothing was happening. In 2018, HP Plus was engaged by USAID to provide support to the government of Nigeria to implement these policies. So we knew that we needed to do a lot of work to make sure, because these policies were there, they were great, but they needed to translate into domestic financing that was needed to make sure that people could access the essential healthcare services that they needed. So some of the things that we did was that we provided a cross-level support at the national level to make sure that the policy of the basic healthcare provision fund was implemented. So we engaged across board the different agencies that were responsible, engaged with the Ministry of Finance, with Parliament, to make sure that these funds were appropriated and that they were released to the relevant agencies. So that was the first hurdle. Now the second hurdle was that for states to be able to access these funds at the national level, they needed to meet a set of criteria. So we were able to provide support across seven states to prepare them First of all, they needed to put in place a state health insurance scheme, as well as a state primary health care agency through which they would draw down on these resources. So we were able to provide the support across seven states to put in place these government um, establishments by first of all making sure that they had a law, they had laws, legal framework, that will first of all establish these agencies, but also make sure that there is financial provision for these agencies. So the additionality there was that, in addition to the fact that these agencies could draw these resources from the federal level, at the state level, we're also able to engage with the governments, the governors, to make sure that at the state level, they also provided for 1% of the state's consolidated revenue fund to go to these agencies to provide for the poor and vulnerable. So we were able to support these states to assess the funding both from the federal level as well as from the state level. And then we provided capacity development across board. So for instance, at the state level, even though these agencies were there, there were some local government systems that needed to be in place that would supervise the quality of care that was needed at the facility level. The healthcare, primary healthcare facilities that hadn't gotten any funding in over decades needed to have help uh, bank accounts through which they could access this funding. They needed to be trained on how to find, manage funds when these funds come to them. They needed to be trained on how to develop quality improvement plans, business plans, on how they would translate this funding coming to them into providing quality services to people. So the capacity development was, you know, it was a cross board from the federal level to the state level to the local government development authorities that needed to be in place to the facility level and even down to the community level for there to be social accountability, for there to be community acceptance, and for people to actually monitor the progress and make sure that this was having the desired effect in the community. So this it was, it, was a, it, was, it was a holistic approach, you know, it cut across engaging with ministries of finance. At the time we were providing the support, we engaged at the Ministry of Finance and the people, some of the people we met there said they didn't know this policy existed. So it involved a lot of advocacy, evidence generation, supporting these structures at the state level as well as at the national level, and building their capacity to be able to develop evidence by themselves, and then use this evidence to engage across board beyond the health sector, and be able to make that multi-dimensional case for health as to why investing in health was a valid thing to do, including the economic benefits as well as the political benefits, because we realized that just making a health case for investments in health was not working anymore. So it was as a result of all this engagement that we could see the, the results that we found, you know, um, resources were mobilized across board, but at the national level, they were able to access these funds. And the four states we started providing support to were the first states that actually assessed this money that was coming from the national level. For over four years, the money was just sitting there, no states could access it. 
But as a result of this support, they were able to access this fund. And you could see the transformation in the communities as a result of this. You know, many communities, they could now see healthcare access in primary healthcare facilities. Before then, you could walk into a primary healthcare facility, you would see goats, you would see a leaking roof, and they didn't have beds and all of that. So communities saw their primary healthcare facilities transformed as a result of these interventions and the communities mobilized. There were some of them went to the point of restoring electricity to this community, to these facilities to make sure that people could now access um, funds uh, and access quality healthcare that they needed at these facilities. I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you. I know uh, there's so much you've done in Nigeria. If you give your time, you can speak the entire day. You know. But we really appreciate those type of experiences because uh, the audience here are eager to know exactly how we did things. So we really appreciate it. So Robert, you have been in Cambodia. And Cambodia has been a very successful country in implementing UHC, Universal Health uh, Coverage. And you've worked in, uh, in, in Cambodia. You were there personally, so share the experience of Cambodia. How did they uh, achieve this? Okay, thank you, David. So um, I'd like to start by giving a little context, and um, people may be aware that in 2017, the Cambodian government launched its National Social Protection Policy Framework, and alongside that also established a very high-level National Social Protection Council. So this body is chaired by the Minister of Economy and Finance, and. Uh, and in recognition of the multi-sectoral aspects of social protection, uh, there are 10 other line ministers who sit on that council. And as a complement to uh, support the work of uh, the council, which is really a decision-making body, uh, the government of Cambodia also established a general secretariat, which is really the workhorse uh, behind, the, uh, behind the council. And they staffed uh, uh, the Secretariat primarily with emerging uh, top talent from within the Ministry of Economy and Finance itself. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, there were, uh, the staff was principally comprised of economists, finance managers, and accountants. And um, when the, the, the leadership team came together, one of the first things they did, we would call it like a landscaping or a mapping, but they were just kind of trying to understand the um, social protection uh, uh, area uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sector. And uh, they called meetings with uh, multiple development partners and all other stakeholders to really kind of get a better understanding of uh, all of the issues and the players. And at that time, HP Plus was convened to a meeting at, uh, with the leadership of the um, General Secretariat who uh, explained about these meetings, that they were having meetings to better understand different uh, specific subsectors, and they were learning a lot. And one of the things they expressed was that they had learned that uh, health is very important, and much more important than they had, they had ever contemplated previously. Um, and they also expressed that they had learned that uh, there were many, many challenges that were, they were facing um, and for the social health protection in Cambodia, and that it was uh, quite complex. Uh, however, they were also, uh, it, 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 they were also open to share that uh, they felt that they had, uh, despite all of these challenges they had uncovered and were unaware of previously, that they had uh, identified a good solution. So we were eager to hear this, and they said, the, sol the solution that we have, uh, we have contrived is really to reserve a desk within the General Secretariat for Health Policy Plus. And we want you to put an expert in our office that will help us to figure it out. And before that meeting ended, they, they said, um, and before we forget, um, you, you should be aware that we also, we have to have regular meetings with the Minister of Economy and Finance. And he is, um, he continues to talk about the importance of, uh, what is our plan for monitoring and evaluation, social protection overall. And 
quite frankly, we're not really sure what he means by that. But please make sure the expert can address that issue as well. <laughs> and so with that, I'd like to uh, ask or project all of us to Cambodia and introduce you to uh, Dr. Norais. Very good afternoon. I am very happy to speak to you during this uh, end of project event of the HP+. I am Narod John, the Secretary General of the National Social Protection Council. The mission of the Council is to lead and coordinate the development of social protection in Cambodia to prevent and reduce poverty, inequalities and vulnerabilities among Cambodian people. I am now standing in front of one of the referral hospitals about one, 120 kilometers away from the capital city Phnom Penh of Cambodia. This hospital provides health care and health treatment services to beneficiaries of the social security scheme being identified by the National Social Security Fund and also the beneficiary of the Health Equity Fund identified with ID poor or equity cards. Beneficiary of these two identification process would come to this area and separate it into these two sides for checking eligibility and validity of their coverage. The procedure would follow and after providing services, this health facility would submit their claim for payment from the scheme's implementer, either an SSF or Health Equity Fund. Under the coordination of the National Social Protection Council and with technical assistance from partners including the USAID through HP Plus so far, we conducted an overall and comprehensive study of the sector initiate an ICT project to streamline and integrate the registration and verification process to monitor and evaluate the service provision and claims but also to assess technical efficiency broadly in order to move toward an ambitious objective which is the universal health coverage. Those assessments and initiatives are now consolidated under the overall plan being developed which is called UHC Roadmap. We appreciate it very much the assistance implemented by Health Policy Plus, which were not only timely, but also right to the point and responded to the needs of the Royal Government of Cambodia. And this assistance helps us in advancing the agenda of evidence to actions and also to build capacity among stakeholders in health social protection here in Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you very much for that video. Before we go to the video so that you just tell us something which I've just heard about leadership, I think I would like to go back to Francis just to share the experience of uh, Nigeria in terms of how HP Plus managed to support the government to integrate magical programs into the insurance scheme. Uh, please, uh, uh, Francis. Thank you, David. So the work that we did was, um, you know, just like Eduardo presented at the beginning, revenue raising, polling, as well as strategic um, purchasing. So it's been recognized by multi-stakeholders that integration of vertical programs into the government UHC reform, which is the health, state's health insurance scheme, was a most strategic way to purchase services. However, you know, not a lot of progress had been made in that regard. So recall at the beginning we had said that you know, the, the, our method is to follow a line with government's priorities. So where an already existing policy is that we support the government and partners and we provide that, that catalysis that is needed to make sure that that policy is implemented. 
But in this case, we actually found out that there was no enabling policy that would support this desirable effect of having vertical programs integrated into health insurance. So one of the things that we did was that we were able to work with the government, since the political will was that, we worked with the government to bring um, stakeholders from across sectors, um, health insurance, the disease agencies, HIV, TB, um, ministries of finance, civil society, private sector, healthcare providers, to sit down and have a round table and reach a consensus about how integration of vertical programs into health insurance was to be successfully implemented or put in place. This led to a national policy document called the National HIV AIDS Blueprint for Integration of Vertical Programs into Health Insurance. So after this national policy document was developed, it needed to be implemented. We didn't stop at just the policy. So working with USAID and with the support of USAID, Lagos State, I'm sure many people here have been to Lagos State, was actually identified as a pilot state to implement this policy, as a proof of concept to actually test that this integration was actually possible. So we were able to provide support to Lagos State by bringing the different stakeholders together across board, multi-sectoral stakeholders, mm -hmm. and leveraging on the trust that we had built in the past and our relationship with these key um, agencies to develop a Lagos State-specific roadmap that actually outlines how this integration was to happen in practice. It's highlighted the comprehensive package of HIV services to be included, how this was going to be done, in a phased approach over time, depending on the financial viability of the scheme. You know, we, we examined, generated evidence to examine technical feasibility, financial feasibility to, through actuarial analysis, and operational feasibility with regards to who will play what role, how will everything be coordinated, and how will this integration actually work out in practice. So as a result of that, I'm actually happy to share that less than one year down the line, Many countries that have done this have taken close to four to five years to do this. But as a result of our ability you know, to work with stakeholders using a locally led approach, we were able to actually get HIV services successfully integrated into the Lagos State Health Insurance Scheme in a space of about a year. And right now, as we speak, HIV AIDS services are being provided through the Health Insurance Scheme. So what they did in Lagos was that they started with HIV counseling and testing. And uh, this has been going on for about a year. And then just this year, HIV treatment has been included into the benefit package. So one of the things that we found is that as the number of people enrolled into the scheme increases, the scheme becomes more financially viable, and they are able to add an additional HIV aid services. So we, we were really appreciative towards uh, USAID and PECFA you know, for actually enabling us to not just focus on integrating HIV AIDS service into the health insurance scheme, but also expanding the work that we did to support the state health insurance scheme to enroll more people by accessing the equity funds from the government, by getting the civil servants payroll deductions approved. And these were the things that actually enabled additional HIV AIDS services to be added into the scheme. I think perhaps the lesson that we've learned there is that the first hurdle to overcome when it comes to integrating vertical programs into um, routine schemes like this is that overcoming that belief that HIV AIDS is the purview of donors. And this we were able to do by evidence, you know, evidence-based advocacy. So for instance, someone from the Ministry of Finance actually what was reached out to us to say, how much are donors spending on HIV AIDS? So we didn't just respond to them, we went to engage them to find out why they were asking this question. And we actually realized that they were asking this question because they wanted to move the funds elsewhere. To say, if donors are spending on HIV AIDS, then we better spend the funds elsewhere. So we took that as an opportunity to actively engage them using evidence to show them that. So for instance, 80% of HIV financing is from donors. Despite this massive funding, there is still a hundred billion gap in HIV financing in Nigeria, which we know that Nigeria is as the second highest HIV burden in the world. So by being able to present this evidence to them and engage them, we actually turn them, people from the Ministry of Finance, Budgets, and Parliament, into advocates of HIV AIDS. 
As a result of that, we didn't just successfully get this integration to happen, but we even got them to give additional budgetary allocation to HIV AIDS, even in the light of COVID, when other agencies didn't get additional allocation to them. So multi-sectoral collaboration was very important, getting the other people who have the power to draw the resources to the healthcare sector to know what we know. It's because if we don't do that, we'll only be preaching to the choir. And then being able to leverage on that to actually uh, be accountable and demonstrate results at the end is what is going to be very vital for this um, integration process. Thank you, thank you, Francis. Uh, like I said there's so much we can learn from Nigeria. I think we will have another session tomorrow. We, we, we discuss Nigeria's experience. There's so, so much. But when you read, you can't finish. But before we go further, I saw uh, uh, Robert from the, the video, uh, Dr. Narit, uh, uh, emphasizing the importance of leadership and how essential it is to reach uh, results. Can you just expound on that? And, uh, because you were there, uh, tell us how is that uh, leadership uh, very critical in achieving results? Yeah, thank you, David. So, um, a, a few months following the, the meeting that I mentioned, um, I found myself sitting behind that desk. <laughs> and uh, was being invited to a lot of meetings with the development partners uh, from my new colleagues uh, within the Ministry of Economy and Finance. And um, over a period of a few weeks, I realized that they, they continuously asked in different meetings and forums uh, basically the same line of questioning. Um, and we're getting all different kinds of responses. Um, and so it kind of, made me wonder what you know why i'm not clear exactly why they continue to ask these same same questions and elicit basically this kind of same general responses and so i approached uh, one of my closest uh counterparts and said he said well, he said don't you see the problem and i said no i'm sorry help me out i don't i don't see the problem and he said every time we ask the question the answers come back and we learn more about social health protection in Thailand, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Germany, in Japan. We know a lot, we've learned a lot. But what we don't know is what is the right system for Cambodia. And so that basically set in motion a, a series of events that uh, led us to create a research agenda establish uh, an internal research team and undertake uh, a number of studies of several of which have been published in peer reviewed journals and more importantly have been used to uh, inform uh, basically an action agenda for UHC which is the foundation of the UHC roadmap that Dr. Ritz uh, mentioned in the video. Um, it really uh, served to help build consensus around um, the, the the way forward uh, for UHC in Cambodia. Um, in parallel, uh, the work in uh, on M monitoring and evaluation, I, I really believe that, um, especially over the first several weeks, there, there was a concept that this was going to be something that could be completed within two or three, month, two or three months. And um, over time, people started to understand that this is not something that you do and check off your list and, and you've completed it but it becomes central to the work you do. Um, and it really is, is a management information system um, to, uh, to ensure the, the progress uh, and achievement of results. Um, and uh, so we, we, with the establishment of an internal research, uh, I'm sorry, internal m and &E team, uh, also developed an operational manual, a uh, software, online software program, that's embedded within the Secretariat's uh, uh, internet uh, web website, as well as legal framework that engages all of the implementing line ministries to report in their, uh, their uh, achievements, basically, and then com compile that data and compare it alongside budget and expenditure information. Uh, so really, I think advancing this idea of um, that was spoken in the last panel around governance, transparency, and accountability. 
Um, and I think that one of the one of the I think key moments was when we developed the beta system for this uh, overall M and E system to help people understand what it could look like with all of the dashboards and the data feeding into it. Uh, one of the um, one of the sector directors um, internally, uh, I this is the people's light bulbs going off, you know, when they, when they realize what this is. She said, I just, she said, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, when, this, when we implement this, this means that we will no longer need to go to our development partners to get the information that we need to oversee social protection portfolio in Cambodia. And I said, you've got it. So, Thank you very much, Robert. I, I know we, we really are short of time, uh, but uh, I have just one minute left, and I'll give only to one person, just to share any challenge if any, uh, in the course of uh, implementation, because we would like to have a chance for our audience to also ask questions. Mr. Mashiri, any challenge in the course of implementation? Yeah, we faced many challenges, but I will just pick one to pick one. I think when we were supporting the healthcare financing strategy, the Minister of Health was responsible for mobilizing stakeholders. And one thing that stakeholders used to ask is that we have political goodwill and we have Minister of Finance on board. And the answers that we used to get, to get in our meeting is that yes, there's political goodwill and Minister of Finance is on board. And we produced draft one of the strategy, draft two of the strategy, draft three of the strategy, and draft four. And I remember getting a call from Minister of Health telling me that they are going to cabinet tomorrow. Can I print nice copies for the cabinet tomorrow? And I mobilized my team and I said, this thing has to go, it has to go to the cabinet. So we did very nice copies and we went to cabinet. And we were waiting for the stamped approval the following day. So the following day when we checked with the Minister of Health, we were told, sorry, your document was not approved. <laughs> we asked why? And the answer was that the Minister of Finance raised a fundamental question. Why does the Minister, why does the Minister of Health want money? And whatever they have been getting, they are not spending. So that took, it took more than two, two years for the Ministry of Health to be able to answer those questions. Two years. So we just got the approval of the strategy earlier this year. So it's important that when you are doing a strategy, political goodwill buy in. That high level is important and carry with you the Minister for Finance because at the end of the day, the President addresses that guy. Thank you very much. I think we have run short of time. Uh, unless one has any burning comment to make, we would like to allow our audience also to ask a question if they have any. Yes, please. Uh, first, the mic. Thank you very much. Farley Claiborne, Palladium. Um, how has the COVID pandemic over the last two years changed any of this? I can give you more detail. <laughs> First try to respond. So I can say that um, with the COVID pandemic, um, there was obviously um, I think globally, but if I can speak to Cambodia with direct knowledge, a real concern about how um, the, the poor and vulnerable would be affected um, by the economic downturn in particular. And so the Secretariat uh, is being really you know, responsible for the oversight of all of the intersectoral response for anything related to social protection took upon itself to first uh, engage with internal resources uh, and the research team to lay out a lot of um, how uh, a cash transfer program could be monitored and evaluated. Um, and then, which also helped to inform the design of that um, cash transfer scheme. And ultimately uh, led to, uh, or I guess another, another kind of uh, contributory point was uh, some previous uh, work that the research team had done had highlighted um, a lot of inclusion, exclusion error in the, the ID poor identification systems for enrollment that Dr. Rich spoke to. 
And so that research um, helped, was used as evidence to accelerate a, a rollout of a digital, uh, basically a validation of enrollment of the ID core system, resulting in a net increase of getting some people out of the system that were, were ineligible due to uh, basically income stratification, uh, higher, higher income uh, households but had a net increase of about uh, 500, uh, half a million people were added uh, to, to the ID4 system and were granted an equity card and really unleashed and unlocked um, a cash transfer to, to equity card households that uh, is now surpassed. I think that the latest figure we have on the slide, I just checked it last night, uh, upwards of uh, over $600 million has now been transferred to um, poor households in Cambodia, and a lot of that was unlocked with um, uh, the work that was done by the research team um, and uh, supported by HP+. Thank you, Robert. Uh, you want to add okay. to that? Good question. I think you know, what happened is that, um, you know, health is funded by tax from national treasury. And COVID shrunk the GDP growth from high of about five point something percent to one point nine. So that affected the revenue that Treasury would be able to mobilize to support the health sector. And because of that, the budget for the health sector has had also to shrink to support because of that level of revenue growth. So it's, it's affecting COVID has affected the revenue of the good health sector. We hope that with with now vaccination, with post mitigation factors, things are going to improve. But for now, I can say that uh, if you look at the funding with our sector, the cash flow, those issues are uh, affecting the, the whole delivery of the system. Thank you. Uh, yes, I just, so yes, you want to yeah, hear? Yes. yes. So I think, uh, of course, the COVID response, uh, the COVID pandemic, and then the response and everything that happened in regards to that affected, you know, financing of major disease programs. There are a lot of publications out there that actually have this evidence. But I think that some of the ways that we've been able to overcome this, um, I would say three key areas. One is use of evidence. The second one is positioning ourselves as a government ally and being responsive to the needs of the government. Because it would be quite naive for government to be saying, I need to find a way to overcome COVID. And you're standing there talking about HIV financing. That would be quite insensitive. So being able to respond to what the government is asking for at that particular point in time and becoming an ally. And then finally, I would, what I would like to call working smarter, and I would explain. So um, with regards to evidence generation, we were able to you know, provide evidence to say that, look, if priority disease um, areas like HIV, AIDS, RMSCH are not being funded, we are going to run into even a bigger problem than the COVID pandemic, you know, and we had evidence to, to share and things like that to show it. And so we were able to engage with the government and, you know, we were able to demonstrate and show them. And as a result of that, you know, actually this year, HIV AIDS in, in one of the states we work in, legal states, was the only, you know, agency that got additional, and they actually got additional 86 million appropriated to HIV AIDS, even though there was a general government circular to say, we're not going to give you any increase in allocation because of the recession from COVID. So use of evidence to drive that information. And then also being able to show them that countries that had UHC systems in place fared better with COVID. You know, that was also another very valid argument that we were able to use. Now, in regards to making ourselves a government ally, which I think also helped case one, was that during when the COVID response was there, of course, that was not the time to be talking about funding for HIV AIDS. We aligned ourselves with government priorities. We made sure we were very useful to the government tax forces, both at the national and at the state level where we were working. They were looking about financing systems for combating COVID, engaging the private sector on COVID. We were right there, we were in front, we were with them, coming up with ideas and all of that, even though it wasn't in our work plan. By doing that, we were able to demonstrate that we were a government ally, we, that the things that matter to the government matter to us, and that made us you know, a trusted ally. So when it came to time to ask for additional funding for say HIV, AIDS, COVID, um, RMACH, it was easier for us to access it because we were there with them, you know, in those times of trouble. And then thirdly, what I would call working smarter 
So, um, for instance, when do, in, the, in the heat of COVID, one of the things that we did was that rather than supporting the government agencies to write memos for HIV um, releases, asking for, say, for purchase of test kits and all of that, we took the place in their budgets that said uh, releases for PPEs for HIV frontline workers. So that was release of funds going towards HIV AIDS, but it was speaking to COVID. Because at that point, all that the government was releasing was COVID. Any, any memo that came to the table of the governor that didn't have COVID in it was thrown away. So we, we were able to work smarter by linking, you know, HIV AIDS specific programs to COVID and making sure that the frontline HIV workers, those working in labs and facilities and all of that were able to access PPEs using their HIV funding. So I'm going to. Thank you. Uh, our partners will be around for any further discussion. We've really run out of time. Uh, unless somebody has any burning questions, uh, I would like to wrap it at that point so that we allow our panelists uh, time to, to respond to any extra questions that you may be having. <laughs> yes. Hi, Elise Lang from Open Development. Um, if you could provide advice to a lower income country that has lower resource mobilization, lower capacity, still developing a health insurance scheme, what advice would you give them? Where should they start? I think, I think uh, let, let, me, let me give it a shot. Uh, I think uh, if you are to advise a lower middle income, lower, lower, lower resource country, I think there is no one solution that fits all. But if that country has got um, a large informal sector, in most cases that informal sector you can be able to organize. Uh, so, so that that organized you know, informal sector is able to contribute to, to, the, to the insurance. And of course, there is also a bit of formal sector that you can be able to start to tap immediately. Okay, so you can do a face, face approach, start with that formal sector who have got, you know, guaranteed income, organize the informal sector. Of course, there will be people that cannot be able to afford those ones, then you can probably see whether the government can be able to, you know, contribute their premiums on behalf of those one of our populations. So it has to be a phased approach targeted uh, to different uh, groupings. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists who have been able to uh, discuss uh, their experiences today and also thank you the audience who have been listening. And I would also like to say that the panelists are around for any further discussion after this uh, panel. So please feel free to mingle and ask any further questions. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davy, and uh, thank you so much to the excellent panelists. Health financing, um, I must say I'm biased, is probably one of my best topics, and I'm sure we, would, we wouldn't end this discussion if left to me. So I want to thank you for your indulgence. And at this point, we come to the end of our panels, you know, but just like we said, if you scan the barcode over your, your table, you, it will take you to our page where you get more information about this work that we're doing. You would also get more information about the people doing this work, and you can reach out to them to get more information as you need. So right now, I would like to invite back on stage to close this event, Sunita Shama, who is the Project Director for Health Policy Plus. job presentations were excellent. There's so much to learn from and I think, it, I'm sure it was a good discussion and everything and we welcome if you can go to our website, look at more information, all of that there. But I really, it's when we talk about this work, it's like so many people work on this project in DC, in different countries. It's a collective effort, collective impact. I think that's very important. Each and every person on this project 
they are making very good contributions and that because of that and their commitment, their passion, their all the work they do day, day and night, even when we're preparing for this event, I know our comms team, and we work with our consortium partners, they are working.